haven't seen you for a while, so good to see everybody again. I think a couple of you have actually taken this last year. I think we did the best compost in Memphis. We'll do a re refresh report, so I do believe. Compost is always a hot topic with everybody. So, Warren, I know you compost some. I do. Yeah, I know that. So, the rest of you guys compost yes, too? Okay. How's everybody compost the ones you guys use? I'm using a tumbler, a pan type thing. I have okay. two of them. I use one to actively put stuff in while the other cures for you know, 15 you. minutes. Switch. Yeah. Warren, you use on a static pile, don't you? Yeah, I have a three foot diameter aerated yeah, static pile. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I turn at the pile and I just may also uh, work at the banana meal garden. I think you can. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And so I, I turn the compost, you see that they have four bins there. You know, they built those the bins off my original design, West oh, Virginia yeah. State when I was there. Yeah, Gene came talked, down. I talked to Gene and she said you were, you had been out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gerald with the city of South Charleston came down with his engineer and they, I told him what I would have done different and then they put that concrete on the bottom. And those are very nice. And if you can afford to do something, Animals yeah. got or like what we built. I mean, yeah, those are those are nice when you've got the tractor. But most of us are homeowners, so we're going small um, compost piles and everything like that. So we'll kind of cover some of the do's and the don'ts today, guys. So maybe some of them you may know, some of them you don't know. So why compost? There? There's a couple slides in the beginning, guys. If you want to flip through, that's just all of our Patriot Garden stuff there. Contact information, our mission statement. So you guys can read that at your leisure. Um, why compost though? Obviously, I think most of us know it gives you a pretty clean source of compost for your garden plants. I know very few gardeners that do not compost. Um, unfortunately, right now, I'm not composting at my house uh, this year, just due to some other reasons, but I've been just bagging stuff up and let the city take it to their compost facility if it goes to there. I'm skeptical about that sometimes. Uh, keeps unnecessary waste out of landfills. I think that's a big thing. I mean, that's what I feel bad about. If I'm putting something in a clear bag, is it going to the landfill or is it actually going to the city compost facility? I'm sure you guys have probably seen a lot of stuff on Facebook where people are saying that this is going to the landfill. I don't know. Maybe I should follow the recycling truck one day. <laughs> uh, great way to recycle and help your environment. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's always a big plus too. And best of all, it improves your soil health. And I think that's what most of us small medium-sized gardeners are trying to do is break down our garden waste and make some available fertilizer for other plants. A few rules of composting basics. And guys, I will tell you what, I've worked now for 15 years on composting. When I was at West Virginia State University, we did a grant for three years where we did nothing but composting stuff. The tumbler that you have, a lot of the other uh, tumblers that lay on the ground that roll, uh, the ones that flip this way, we did the static bins. We did a lot of different systems that to try to see which one works the best. And we'll talk about those here in a minute. Uh, because there was mixed results with them, a lot of mixed results with them, but it all comes back to how well you manage your pile too, is what, what I have learned. But a few basic rules of uh, composting is the minimum dimensions of a pile should be three foot wide, three foot high. So Warren, you're right on the spot where you need to be. Reason why, if it's any smaller than that, three foot by three foot, you know, it's kind of hard for that pile to heat up. The microbes get a little bit cold. They like to kind of stay buried in that. So uh, three foot by three foot minimum. And obviously you can go as big as you want after that. Uh, well, we don't want to get too crazy, but you can you can go up to a 10 by 10 is what I would say before. I would say it's going to be too much. And if you've got a tractor or a piece of machinery, obviously 10 by 10 or even a little bit bigger will work, work out real nice. Your carbon to nitrogen ratio, we'll talk about those in a minute, but you want a 30 to one is what your ratio should be. So when you're layering your compost pile or making your compost, that's what you're trying to shoot for. Problem with 30 to one is, is you tend to have more waste of one pipe at one time than you do all the wastes. So what I'm saying is, as you clean out that garden, you've got a whole bunch of green, wet material, but then you don't have a lot of dry material. So dry material always seems to be the harder source to get for most people. Although we live in the middle of the forest, there's lots of leaves around, most of us got them in the yard. Um, I try to tell people, worst case scenario, I don't want you to spend money on making compost if you don't have to, but you know you can't buy a bell straw, keep that near the compost pile so you've got some dry material when you've got a lot of wet. Or you can bag up those leaves and put them in a shed somewhere. You don't really want to leave them outside in the trash bag because they'll sweat and condensate. The leaves get all wet and nasty inside. But if you've got a way to keep pine needles or your dry material dry and you know when you need to use it, uh, it works out really well. There's a website right there, that www.compostccscornell.edu. That is probably the best website that I have ever visited in my life to talk about compost. So I 
I'll put that in that slide so you guys can look at that um, and whenever you get a chance to hop on the computer. Cornell, obviously, you guys know, is a very good action school. They've done a lot of stuff with horticulture and things like that. So they, they put a lot of work into their uh, their compost stuff. So that's a good resource to use to kindly brush up or if you're having a problem with your pile. Obviously, you can always call me or Brad or Connie. Uh, we'll glad to fill your guys' or, or questions. And if we don't know the answer, then you know we will find somebody that does. Your best compost pile temperatures are between 120 and 170. Do you, any of you guys have a compost pile? You ever go out and check your thermometer or are you just sticking your hand in there trying to do the old field test? It works. Thermometers are nice to have though, guys. I mean, you could buy a compost thermometer. They just look like a big giant thermometer, but they've got the long three-foot prod on them so you can get them down in that pile. You know, you only want to go halfway in just like if you're checking a roast or something, you don't want to go all the way to the ground. Um, I like a compost thermometer. That might be something that you guys ask the wife for Christmas. It's a good Christmas gift, I think. So, you know, if you don't have one, maybe you can ask for Father's Day or birthday. Hey, give me a compost thermometer. But that thermometer tells me a lot. The hand test works real good, but the thing with the thermometer is you're going to get a real time. I mean, most of us humans are not going to know the difference between 170 and 150. It's going to feel about the same one. Uh, and that compost thermometer will give you right down to the degree to what that is. Why is that important? Obviously, if the pile starts to cool, you know you need to mix it or add more. And a lot of times when you're doing the hand test, you're waiting for it to drop maybe 30, 40 degrees before you've really got a noticeable temperature drop. And that's okay, but if you're in a hurry to get your compost turned or broke down so you can use it, that thermometer is going to give you real-time reading to be able to flip that pile immediately when you start to see that 10 degree drop. Usually when it drops 10 degrees in a 24-hour period, that's an indication to me that, hey, the pile needs to be flipped or I need to add more material or maybe the pile is done. So, you know, you're just going to have to gauge that with your uh, eyes. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. Layering, roughly you want four inches of dry material to every two inches of wet material. So I always explain that as a lasagna. You'll see that in a lot of other publications, that, that lasagna. Now, obviously, when you start mixing that pile, that lasagna is all mixed up. But keep that in the back of your mind when you're adding new material on top of your existing compost. Four-inch layer of dry to two-inch wet. You've got a bunch of wet, and that's really when you got to do four inch dry, two inch wet, four inch dry, two inch wet until you run through all your material. As you guys can see, that carbon source, that dry material, you're going to need a lot more dry material than you do wet material. But when we clean out the garden, we can, we pick out all of our cold fruits, that's all wet material, that's a nitrogen source. So, what I see a lot of people do a lot of time is they just load that pile up with a lot of wet material and they don't put enough dry material in there. And they go septic and it starts to stink and the critters are coming in a lot of people get discouraged especially if you live in town you've got neighbors and the neighbors mad hey i'm smelling your compost pile hey i've seen a rat run out of your compost pile those are problems we run into with the city um, so just keep that in the back of your mind if you want to help that pile out and try to keep it more static and get nasty you've got to add more carbon more dry material to that wet material which is why i say you may have to store some dry material somewhere property to use in those times. Um, carbon sources, guys, corn stalks, they're dry. We're talking about dry corn stalks here, not wet. If they're wet, they're more of a nitrogen source. Hay straw, dried grass, all that works great. Here's something that you can do. Um, I know some of us are better mowing our lawns than others. Um, I go through phases where I'm on top of it for weeks at a time and then I get busy and then I might not cut it for three weeks and it's super tall and I'm out there fighting and it's all clumped up. Those clumps that's on your grass, let them dry out for a second. Um, if, uh, if, you, uh, if you let them dry and then you come back with the rake, you know, that's just like letting hay dry out when you cut hay, that turns that into a carbon source, that, that dry grass is great. So if you've got some, if you're going to collect it in a bagger, then go ahead and take that grass and maybe dump it out somewhere on the edge of your driveway on the concrete, out in the sun, and let that dry out for a day or two, and then rake it back up. I know it's a little bit of extra work, but it is a free, Free, uh, dry source if you're needing some dry material. That's one way to do it in town. Shredded newspaper. How many people still take the newspaper? Yeah, yeah. I, I've been running into a problem with that. One. Um, we can say shredded computer paper, though, like this right here. Be careful with collard eggs, guys. Uh, most new collard eggs are soy based now, so they're okay to use in the compost pile, but magazines that are glossy, got the glossy type paper, don't use that in the compost pile. There's heavy metals inside those inks and that's going to transfer over into your garden once you're going to eat that in your fruit at some point it's going to suck those heavy metals right up 
but a lot of the computer paper, if I have like our copier out here, I know that it uses a soy based collar. And I look on the cartridge at, at the collar and look, where's the collar? We got a collar. Oh, one over here. One time just to see what it was. Um, so make sure if you're using collar paper that it's soy based ink and you're okay to go. But if you don't have shredded newspaper, then computer paper works great. I'm lucky because we work here at the guard, they've got shredders everywhere. And nobody really cares if you go over and spill a bag. And we've got the good shredders here that turns it into confetti, so it's not the long strips. It's actually a really good material. So uh, you can use that. You can also use the newspaper. Uh, sawdust and dryer lint. Nobody ever thinks about dryer lint. Everybody goes down, cleans the dryer lint out, and throws it away. That dryer lint can go in your compost pile. Human hair can be composted. It will break down. Uh, and all that dryer lint is mostly cotton. Remember polyester shirts like this that are wrinkle free, they don't ever wear out and you can wash these things a million times and they still look good. But your cotton shirts, you know, flannel shirts, all of that cotton material can be put in there. Sawdust, I'm a woodworker. I don't know if any of you guys woodwork. I, I would work as a hobby. I always collect all my sawdust out of my table saw. Uh, I've got a central dust collector, so whenever I get that, I will let thing out in the driveway, pull the dust one everywhere, and I dump it into a trash bag, and I can use that sawdust. It works great. Be careful here again, though. If you're using pressure treated lumber, be very careful about that. Um, black walnut dust affects some people more than others. It's allopathic, so it does have some properties called lung irritation. So just be careful if you're using that too. Usually, once you put it in your compost pile, though, some people say, well, you know, that, that allopathic, that's going to kill other plants in the garden. I have not seen, read, or heard of anybody who has used black walnut sawdust unless you're using a large quantity of it. And most of us aren't doing that unless you're going to the sawmill before it would become toxic to the garden. So I'm gonna go ahead and say you're okay in the wood shop if you're cutting a few black oak boards and that sawdust can be mixed in with your other sawdust, you should be fine. Just watch out for the pressure treated. Wood ash and leaves. Uh, obviously we know we just talked about leaves. Wood ash is a great source of carbon too. I know a lot of people burn the pellet stoves now. I know there's a lot of ash that comes out of those along with other wood burning stoves. So if you guys have got the wood ash, that can go in. Nutshells and cotton, so peanut shells, Christmas time rolls around, everybody's got the English walnuts and the hazelnut mixtures out on the table. Save those shells, that all can be composted too. Uh, cotton, that was kindly relative, but you know, believe it or not, you can compost a cotton t-shirt. So if you look at a t-shirt that says it's 100% cotton, you can strip that thing up and cut it into little pieces. You want to cut it into little pieces, trust me. If you leave it in long pieces, it takes a while long before it to break down. But you can compost your white undershirts and things like that. So uh, once again, if they're collared, I would be careful about that. A lot of clothes are still using chemical dyes. If you know for a fact it's a natural dye, then, then by all means you can use that shirt too. Uh, pine needles, if you've got a pine grove on your property somewhere, and I know there's buku needles underneath those things all the time. They're all the time shedding. Pine needles work very well too. I will tell you guys that pine needles are slow breakdown. Even if you run them through a chipper, they seem to still come out as a pine needle. Uh, they're not a big enough needle or wells in there to chop them up. Cereal boxes and cardboard boxes, they all work great too. Once again, if it's a collared cardboard box, if you get something fancy from the internet that comes with all the logos on it, you might be careful about if that's a soy-based ink. If you don't know, I wouldn't use it. But regular cardboard or your cereal, uh, General Mills, I know for a fact, all of their ink on their boxes now is soy-based. If you flip on the box, somewhere on the box down near the barcode, they actually have a symbol on there talking about that, that it's soy-based, you wanna look for that. There's an international organization that bases all that stuff, like there is for a lot of things. Your nitrogen sources, your wet sources, wet corn cobs and condiments can be composted. Fruits and vegetables, you guys probably already know that one. Coffee, tea bags, and filters. I, very few people have coffee filters or tea bags anymore. We're all on the cure eggs. Um, I know here we collect them around the building, and some days me and Brad, if we got a hole in the day, we'll sit over here and fill the top off the cake cups dump the coffee grounds out. But, uh, you know, back in the day, everybody had the coffee filter. You could just pick the coffee filter and the coffee grounds up and go to the compost bin. You guys still use a regular coffee pot, anybody? Yeah? All right. Uh, well, on that, too, you could also, if you've got a local coffee shop or Starbucks or whatever, they'll usually hold coffee grounds for you. You'll have to go every day and pick them up. You know, otherwise, they throw them in the trash. But most of the time, they're more than willing to, to share those with yeah. you. And there's a tutor's in about every town in West Virginia, so I'm sure you can go to your local tutor's and ask them. I know they brew a lot of coffee. 
bread and grain products obviously got that stale loaf of bread, so that's a compost pile, macaroni, that type of thing can all go out there. Your cut flowers, your eggshells can go in. I will caution about cut flowers, though. I see a lot of people do that. But see, here's what I don't like about cut flowers and what I don't like about using hay. There's seeds in there. And the heat of the compost pile will not kill those seeds. So there's a good chance that you can throw in this year's cone flowers and black eyed Susans into your compost pile. But there's a good chance that you're going to have a bunch of volunteers come up in your garden next year. So just keep that in the back of your mind. What I will do a lot of times, guys, at the end of the season, uh, with my flower beds, I'll go through with my pruners and I will just go ahead and deadhead and cut all the seed heads off and throw those in a bucket. And what seed I don't keep or can't give away, I'll just toss that in the regular trash or throw it over the hill if you've got some place and then compost the stalks of the, of the flowers and stick them up. You know, usually cone flowers are never this tall, so you got a lot of biogas down there. Livestock manure, can't say enough about that. I think everybody in the room knows that's probably the best compost. It's kindly already compost. If you've got poultry manure, turkey, chicken, that's probably some of the best stuff that you can add into a compost pile. Um, I know a lot of people are getting into the backyard with chickens. Connie back here that we brought on our staff, she's working really hard to coach up some people on some chicken stuff, so we're gonna try to push out those classes if you guys are interested in that down the road. But why not go ahead and use all of that chicken waste and scrape it up and put it in that compost pile? That will heat a compost pile up like no other. Fresh poultry litter will bring a compost pile back to life almost within 12 hours. It's amazing once you put it in there. Uh, rabbit, any of that other type of livestock animals like that, they all work great too. Horse manure, if you've got a line or a load on it. A lot of the times the stables around town here, they they don't care. You show up and pick up a truck, yeah, there's the mile of shovel or whatever. You know? but sometimes if you get a vice farmer, he'll have a tractor and he'll actually load your truck. But if you can get some manure and put in there, that's going to be all the better. And then wet grass and plant trimmings. And once again, guys, the wet grass, if you want to mow it wet and it's in the bagger or you rake it up wet and put it in, it's going to be a nitrogen source. But like I said, if you leave that wet grass lay out for the afternoon or you dump the bagger out on the edge of the concrete or somewhere on the edge of your property and just scatter it out and let it dry in the sun and rake it back up, it then becomes a carbon source for you. So uh, grass can actually go twofold. I kind of like long grass better than I do hay because usually you cut long grass so much there's no fluorescence, no seed heads on that. So, you know, that's just a seed free. Uh, mixture right there. So the compost basics, guys. Make sure that your compost material is as small as it can be before adding it to the pile. This is the one that I tell you guys to take your pen and circle. Here's what I cannot stress to you enough. I have made so many mixtures of compost in my life. There's one person in this room that I know right now that just bought a brand new wood chipper, and he's already well ahead on this, this old gig. But I'm telling you guys, if you can chip up your plant material, and I'm even talking your wet tomato vines and your peppers, run them through a chipper and grind them up into a pulp, your compost pile will heat up so quick and that compost will break down and you will have the prettiest compost you've ever seen. You'll have compost that looks just like soil. You won't have chunks and pieces in it. But I know that it's hard if you don't have a wood chipper. But what I told a couple of my small homeowners is on Amazon right now, you can buy an electric chipper that'll chip up to three quarter inch about your thumb for about 70 bucks. And it plugs in and it's real quiet. It doesn't make a lot of noise. And for the small home gardener, you know, you just break all your stuff up, get in the lawn chair and sit there and just start beating things through. You can make some really, really nice compost. Do you need to do it? No. But at very least, when you're throwing those tomato vines and you're throwing in those tall pepper plants, instead of throwing them in at five feet, at least hack them up with a machete or take the lawn or run over pop up. That's a great way to do it too with a bagger and collect everything. But sometimes tomato vines and lawnmower blades don't like each other. So I've, I've done this before by you know, uh, uh, experience and sometimes you have to stop the lawnmower and pull the spark plug cable, flip it over and wrap that, uh, that vine back off there. But I cannot stress enough, guys, what I like to explain to everybody, and I didn't bring it with me today, I forgot, but I usually will bring a basketball with me and a marble. And I tell everybody that basketball is a piece of food and that marble is the micro. Now think about that micro trying to eat that big piece of food, but if you take that basketball and you chop it up into small pieces, those microbes can colonize those pieces so you get more microbes on the pieces and it breaks it down quicker. That's exactly what's happened. The bigger pieces you throw in the compost pile, the longer it's going to take to break it down. So the method that most people have been taught over the years is you can make that static pile like you got one, and then you get a sieve or a screen and you throw your compost up there and you start breaking it back and forth and then all the big pieces that haven't broke down you throw back in the pile and collect all that underneath. To me that's labor intensive. 
Uh, I kind of only like to spend my time on the front end, just chip everything up and get it into the piles. So that way when it's broken down, it's broken down. There is no screening or sitting. Some people don't care about that. I've seen some people say, Chris, I don't care. I just throw it all out in the garden and let it finish breaking down out there. And that's fine too, that's all preference. But uh, a lot of people don't want chunks of wood and stuff playing out in the garden. It may take five or six more years for them to break down at the speed of hard time. So try to get your stuff broke down as small as you can. Your compost pile will heat up quicker, it'll break down faster, and you'll get a much better product. Uh, if you've got access to a neighbor who's got a wood chipper and you're on the fence about it, do what Chris is telling you today, chip up your stuff, and then let me know here in a few months what you think. I have a feeling you'll come back and say, yeah, that was well worth the little bit of work that it took to chip that up. And not to mention, a pile of tomato vines this tall and this wide going through a chipper ends up in a five gallon bucket when it's done. So your pile is a lot, lot smaller too. So if you've got limited space, chipping it up is also a great for that. Chris? Uh, yes? Just for the being on the chipper issue there, an eight foot long, five foot wide, and five to six feet tall stack of trimmings off the trees and branches and whatnot in front of the chipper fills about number three bushel. Okay, so there you go. Yeah, number three. So you got a great big blob yeah. of stuff and it comes out in you know, a pile probably about that big round, about that tall. Right. And, and, and that's and, and what I will tell you guys too is the microbes. If you ever have been around the waste treatment plant and they actually they run the wastewater through the last process it goes through these filter beams. The reason why they call it filter beads is actually these plastic balls. They look like weird little geo balls. They've got all kinds of little holes on them. And the reason why is that's for bacteria to colonize that. So in this tank that the water is running through, instead of just having the microbes in there just sloshing around, they fill it full of these beads and those microbes actually grow a biofilm on those plastic beads. And then as that, that water is coming through, it filters and eats out all the bad stuff and makes the water cleaner. Same thing with your compost break it down into small pieces, you're given more surface area for the microbes to colonize. So not only are they going to break it down quicker, they're going to make, there's going to be millions of more microbes because there's more space for them to grab onto in the food source. So as long as you keep feeding them, they're going to keep eating and breaking stuff down. But if you've got big pieces of food, only so many microbes can colonize that one big piece, but that one big piece chipped up into a lot of small pieces, millions of more microbes are there. So you increase your population by breaking your stuff down. Uh, remember, your teeth is like the first part of your digestive system, so you chew to break food up. Your stomach kindly does the rest. It's kindly in that same same line of thought, too. Um, you can mix your pile every 10 to 14 days or leave it alone as a static pile. Warren, I know where you live at. If I lived where you lived and I had property and didn't have a lot of neighbors up on top of me, I'd be doing exactly what you're doing. I'd be doing the, the, the static pile. It's the easiest. It's the, uh, and if you're not worried about time, I know people who build them, they might only put that compost out in the garden every couple of years. They just build that pile and let it break down or they'll dig into the side of it and get stuff out. I leave a fish fork in it so I can turn it every right. in a month or yeah. two weeks. Exactly. Um, in town, if you're trying to do it, you're running the tumblers and things like that, they're actually a little bit more work because you have to go out there and flip them around a little bit more. You've got to check them. I'll talk to you guys here in a minute about some of the problems that I don't like with the tumblers, but they still do work. Um, but yeah, if you're out in the country and you can just build a static pile, that by far is the easiest way to go. But in, when you're in town, it's a little bit more work. But you should have less material than what you do on a farm, so it's, it kindly trades itself off. Uh, what not to compost, obviously cat and dog manure, you don't want to do that. The reason being, guys, is cat food is one of the most heaviest metal laden things there is. I don't know why that is. I don't know if there's a conspiracy not to like cats by the cat companies. But the reason why I know this is I've had a lot of work at waste treatment plants, some prior research that I've worked on, and every waste treatment plant I went to has to suffice the EPA. They can only discharge so many heavy metals a year into whatever their harmonic mean is, their flow is, whatever they're discharging in. And every operator would always complain and be like, you know, the numbers are ridiculous. We have no control over what's coming into our plant and they would always tell me that everybody flushes their cat food down their commodes. So we've got those scoopables now and the clumps and if you read the bottom, I have a went to the store, I don't have a cat in the dog now, but I went, I've read it, it says right on the back, flushable. So, you know, the companies are manufacturing their clumping products to flush the cat food. I get it, if you live in an apartment, you know, you want to get rid of the cat waste, you're not going to put it in the trash can and let it fester for a couple of days. But it's really a 
problem for wastewater operators. Definitely don't put the dog cat more than your compost pile, okay? Uh, dairy products, dairy products will compost, but man, oh man, and the odor they put off and the warming they attract is really, really not worth it. Once again, I had piles 100 yards away from my, my dwellings or whatever. Yeah, if I had a gallon of spilled bad milk and chunk of milk, I'd probably go out there and dump it in the pile. Beer also works great to put in the compost pile. You've got expired beer, put that in there. That'll heat one up pretty fast too. Fats, lards, and grease, and oils. Once again, guys, they will compost and break down over time, but the microbes do have a hard time. You need a different set of microbes to break those down. So you're going to delay the amount of time that it's going to take for your pile to finish, but they will. So we always say not to do it, but you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, meat, fish, poultry, same exact same thing. It will break down and compost too, but you're gonna have an odor issue, you're gonna have a fly issue, you're gonna have skunks and foxes and all kinds of birds and things like that are gonna come in and scratch around. Uh, coal and charcoal ash, once again, we wanna stay away from the charcoal. It's the coal to coal with the head and nose. So if you're burning coal, I don't know anybody that burns coal anymore at their house, but if you, if you do, that's got a lot of uh, mercury in it. Same thing with charcoal. Charcoal is processed and they put some additives in there, especially if it's the match light kind that already sets on fire with all the chemicals in there. So be very careful about that. Types of composting, guys. There's heat composting, which is what we're talking about, static pile, like what you're going for. There's holding units, there's turning units, there's sheet composting, trench composting, and vermin composting. We're gonna talk about all these little methods right here, guys. So heat composting, that's the cheapest, easiest way to do it. Pros can be built with or without a structure. So you can put pallets and make a box. You can do what Manor Mill did and build the bins and put everything in there. Or you can just go out on the property somewhere and just put that pile and, and, and let it break down. Cheapest way to start composting, so you don't need to do nothing but just find a spot on your property and dump everything in a pile. Uh, can be mixed or left as is. Or you're telling me you're mixing yours because you're trying to get that to break down. But I know people who, like I said, will build compost piles and they may not come back to them for two years. They'll have multiple compost piles all lined up along the edge of their property, you know. And that was two years ago, and that was last year, and that's this year's, and they'll, they'll just wait until Mother Nature does everything, and compost pile starts this tall and ends up all the way down here. Uh, pile can be made larger if needed. Obviously, you can keep adding to it. That's, that's relative for yourself. Ponds can be labor-intensive. Why can't it be labor-intensive? Warren just said he's got to put a pitchfork in it, so at some point, he has to go out there with a the pitchfork and flip that. You know, that, that can be difficult for older folks, people that's got uh, disabilities, and will track vermin at some point. It will. I mean, whether you put food in there and you're just putting lawn and landscape, you're still going to get some vermin. You're going to have groundhogs that are wanting to go in there and get material. You're going to have birds. So you're always going to have some stuff digging and pecking around it. But is it really a problem? Probably not if you're out on the edge of your property. The holding units, guys, are very similar to the turning units. Okay, um, I think you guys told me you had the turning units. The holding units are basically a plastic bin, or if you took a trash can and drilled holes in the side of it and just let it set, that would be considered what we're talking about, a holding unit here. Uh, materials can be contained inside that holding unit. It's a little bit more attractive. Can be mixed or left as is as a static pile. Can be built gradually and decorative in the landscape. So for our city people, holding units kindly have some appeal. Cons to it is they can be labor intensive. Because unlike the static pile, where you're just going to take a pitchfork and maybe you're going to move it from left to right, or with the turning units where you're flipping it, these guys pretty much have to be completely dumped out. You're going to have to dump your compost out to a pile and then put it back in the unit and mix it all back up. So it can become very labor intensive. Uh, where do I see this work the best? In a small garden situation where somebody wants to just compost kitchen scraps somebody's not growing a lot of garden material. They don't have a lot of material. Most of their stuff is tea and coffee and pillings and things like that that comes from the kitchen. They work great in that aspect because it's small enough for you to turn over and, and do that. Could, it, could attract farming and give off odors? It will. It will give off odors if you don't put enough dry material in there, but it'll start to stink and fester. And you've got limited in size. Obviously, these holding units are about the size of a 55-gallon trash can is about as big as I've ever seen them. Um, some are square, some are round. Uh, the turning units that you guys have, materials are contained again, so it's, it's a decorative for the landscape. Easily mixed because you're cranking a handle or you're turning the unit yourself by your hand. Less likely to attract varmin for a couple of reasons. One, it's up off the ground, so you know it's usually on plastic legs. Varmin have a hard time getting in there to it. And number two, 
it's a sealed drum. Usually there's a lid on the outside or on the end that you screw tight so nothing can really get in there. The holding units up above set on the ground. And there's a screen that they sell with these things. There's what they call the, the, the Mormon screen that they sell when you get these things. So you think, hey man, I'm good. No, a rat or the hungry enough animal will burrow under the ground and it will actually work and chew that screen until it, it comes, gets into your pocket. It just happens every time. Also, tooth and thin plastic. I've seen this happen one time. I've seen a rat chew through the side of the dam. It just fell right into the pond. It's the craziest thing ever. Um, so, and, and it had to be a rat by the way that it looked. So, I, I'm kind of skeptical about the holding units. Uh, also, too, with the turning units, they're attractive to the landscape, and you get many years of use. Because most of them are black and made out of uh, recycled materials, so they're sunlight resistant. Cons on that could produce an odor limited in size, lifting involved, and excessive moisture. There is some lifting involved. Uh, the ones with the handles are, are very nice for, for, for older folks. Uh, the one that I had actually flipped this way instead of being around, so you actually had to get at the bottom and grab that thing and flip it over. Well, as it gets full, it gets a little heavy to turn over. But here's what I'll ask you too, you said you had a turning unit. What I found, we did a lot of research with plastic units. If you didn't stay on top of them, they condensate. They get hot from the sun and they sweat on the inside. And that excess sweating just keeps that environment so moist that your compost doesn't want to break down. It goes stepping. It gets that nasty smell to it. So you have to add a lot more dry material to kind of soft that up. And that was one of the biggest problems I had with them. But I've had other people say, Chris, I've had the same problem. And other people tell me, hey, I love them. It works great. And I started talking to the people that, that it works for. I talked to the people that it didn't work. And it was the same problem that I had with mine. It's the amount of time that you're going to take to go out there and play with it. So if you're just if you're kind of like the, the busy person and you're going to throw stuff in there and you're not going to go out there and turn it and flip it the way that it needs to be, you're going to end up with this excess moisture problem. If you don't keep an eye on it, if you keep adding some more dry material after your wet material breaks down and you see the condensation on the side, it's not going to work for you. It's just going to turn into a rock nasty soup in the bottom of that thing and it's not going to go nowhere. Your bike roads die is aerobic, it's very nasty. So if you've got that problem, what you need to do is add a carbon source back. You put shredded newspaper in there, the dry leaves, dry grass, straw, or something like that to get that soft up. It's also hard to make the layers inside a turning unit. Do you have a problem with that, or are you just throwing in small amounts of kitchen scrap here and there, or how does that work? I have a problem with that. I have to keep it turned or it will uh, compact. Right. And, uh, yeah. And, and then you do need to get dry stuff in there. It's uh, moist. Plus, there's a wall, and that plastic is two layer condensation will form inside that. I can turn it sometimes here. It's and and here's a little swish it around. Yeah. And that's what happens because you know that compost is hot, and you got the condensation from outside. You're in plastic, it doesn't, doesn't bend. With static piles or wood, wood boxes, if you build wood bins, you know, wood will breathe a little bit, and it, it'll help out. So, I, I'm not going to say that these units are bad by no means because I've got mixed reviews about them, but I, I want to make sure that I set the stage for you guys if you're going to leave this class and go buy something, that here's the possibility and probably what will happen, so you, you need to make the best decision for yourself. Unfortunately, Amazon and all these places like Lowe's, there's nobody there that's going to give you that information. They're, they're going to want to sell you something, so their product's the best thing ever, right? Nobody wants to tell you that, but I, I'm telling you guys from just experience that I've ran into, so I've you know, tried to relay that back to you the best I can. Trench composting, guys, probably one of my favorite things to do. I love the trench compost. Now, trench composting is not the best for yard waste. It's not the best for all the garden waste, but if you've got the kitchen scraps, if you've been canning, you've got a bunch of tomato pills or a bunch of grape skins or something like that, like bucket load of them. And you're like, man, I don't want to put that in my turning unit because I'm going to have to add so much dry material in there. I'm never going to, you know, it's not going to work out for me. Go out on the edge of the garden or down in the furrow beside your plants and dig a ditch, dump all that stuff in there and then bury it back with dirt. That's trench composting just like in that picture. Easy peasy. One of the best ways to do it. I do this a lot in my own garden. Pros for this, no, no turning, no odors, nutrients right where the plants need them, the earthworms and nematodes are going to break it down right in your garden, you're not going to have to do nothing. And no need for any types of bins or piles on the property. I mean, you're barely digging a hole in your cover. Cons, you got to dig. And vermin could dig up the waste. Could dig up the waste. I haven't had anybody ever tell me they've had a problem with that, but it could be done. I guess that also depends on how deep you want to dig your ditch. So you're probably going to ask me how deep should I dig the ditch. 
8 to 12 inches. Obviously, if you go any deeper than that, plant roots aren't there. So I tell everybody 8 to 12 inches, 12 inches maximum, 8 inches minimum, somewhere right in there is where you want to be. So about the state of the shovel down is about as deep as you want to be, and then just dump that stuff in there. If you're going to practice this method, it works beautifully in raised beds. If you've got raised beds, this system works great. You can even go out in the middle of the summertime and dig in between your plants, just take your hand and pull your loose soil back and dump some stuff in, bury it back, go between these plants and do the same thing. You can do that. Now what I would recommend you do, because I forget stuff all the time, is wherever your trench stops, get a stake, get a flag, a survey flag, something, and stick it into that. So that way next week or in two days when you've got more kitchen scratch, you know where you stopped your ditch at. So that way you don't dig back into your good stuff. So keep that in the back of your head too to make sure you put some type of road marker out there. In the picture, I know it's black and white, it's hard to see, but you'll see there's a fence there in that picture, guys. And I think that is some pepper plants that I'm looking at. Might be wrong about that. But you will see in this picture, they've come about 18 inches off those plants and they've dug that ditch right in front and they buried it. It's a great thing to do with it. Because as those plants grow a little bit bigger, the roots are going to extend out. They're going to access that. That's going to give that a few weeks to break down in the ground with the earthworms and nematodes. If it's summertime and warm months when all of the soil microbes are super active, you'd be shocked at how fast they will break that stuff down. It's just like these worm bins that we've got. If you dig back into them about four or five days later, in, in good rich soil that's got a lot of microbes and worm activity, you're, you're going to barely see anything in four days. I mean, that's how fast they're going to jump and eat and break this down. And then as that plant grows bigger over the next four or five weeks, all that nutrients will be available to it as those roots reach out into that ditch. So it's a great way to go. Vermicomposting, guys. We actually will put on a vermicomposting pot just like this here probably before Christmas. Uh, Brad and I have been talking about it because that's a whole different set of, of composting. We'll go over the, the rough details, but we actually have worms right here on the other side of this wall right now in Van Living. So you guys are sitting around about a thousand worms over there. Uh, I keep forgetting all their names, it's hard. I don't reach in there. Uh, pros with the vermicomposting, much richer compost than yard waste compost or pops. There's a reason for that. It's because the earthworm is eating that waste and passing it through its digestive tract. So when it comes out, it's already worm food, if you will. So it's already been composted at least twice over if you look at it that way. So you do get a lot better product. You don't have to worry about stuff being in there because everything's mixed together and it just looks like soil. So go down to Green Steep and see, if you will, spend $10 and buy your three pound bag of worm castings, which I think is ridiculous, but that's what they sell for. And you know, open up that bag and look inside there. And, and what you're looking at, you're like, well, that was food waste. And then it went through the worm. It looks just like coffee grounds, basically, almost. So uh, very, very good compost. Easy to separate finished compost from new compost. That is true. In the worm bin, if you're ready to use your worm casting, you, you dump your worms on a screen. All that good compost is going to fall through. And then the hope is, is the bigger chunks and the worms will stay on the screen. You just put them back in the bin and start adding new stuff. And they'll just keep breaking everything down. Uh, there's no C and E ratio to worry about. So if you're having a hard time with this carbon micro ratio, it doesn't make a difference with worms. You put it all in the worm bin, at least put two inches of, of material on top. Uh, when I say material, I'm talking about existing compost that's already in the bin that they broke down. Or if you're just starting your comp worm bin, you use coconut floor, get that wet, just bury everything under an inch or two of coconut floor. Some people like to take wet cardboard, they like to take nice heavy thick cardboard, soak it in water and get it wet. Leave it out in the rain for, for a couple hours. And they will actually lay that cardboard down on top. So what they'll do is they'll just lift it up throw their food waste in there and then put a piece of cardboard back there. They don't bury it. As long as it's under that cardboard and it's dark and it's moist, the worms are going to come there and do their thing. And worms are really funny. They don't like daylight. So if you want to look at it, it might be better to get in there with a green light because they don't see green light. And you can see them doing their thing and working, especially if you've got grandkids and to get them interested in it. But if I would go over there right now and pull that worm in, we'd start digging. As soon as this artificial light hit them, they just scurry right back down in. They just shoot right back down in as fast as you can slow it off. Um, the bin can be kept in the kitchen. It can. Some people get grossed out about that, especially probably the wives might get mad if you guys go home like, hey honey, I'm going to put a worm bin over here by the trash can. But I'm here to tell you guys, if you're doing your, if you're doing everything right and you're, you're adding the right amounts of food and, and you can't add too much of one thing and the worms can't eat everything and then you will get some smells, that's what the other class is about. Um, if you're doing everything right, you're not going to have a problem. 
I mean, you can pretty much eat inside that thing and not even know it's there. There's, there's, there's no smell. And then when you do take the lid off of it, every once in a while you may get a, a little whiff of something rot, but most of the time it smells like wet mushrooms or leather. And that means you're doing, you're doing a good job. Um, free fishing worms, many of you guys fish. We all know that you know fishing worms are a little pricey and sometimes when you go to the Nomar or wherever you're trying to buy them, they seem like you never have them in stock. They're always sold out of them. You don't have to worry about that anymore. You can just go out there to your worm bin and pull them back, grab a handful of them and run down the road. If you got neighbors that like to fish, maybe you can start charging them for those night crawlers instead of uh, Nomar getting that money. So there is that. A uh, fun way to compost to get small children involved in gardening. I cannot stress that enough. If you've got small kids, you know, that's a great way to introduce them. Most kids love worms or are intrigued by worms. You know, everybody's got to eat, so it's a great way to teach them lots of things, just not uh, getting involved in gardening, but it's a great way to teach about recycling and science and life cycles and the whole thing. Because you will have sexually active worms in there. You'll have juvenile worms. You'll have eggs in there. So it's a great way to explain lots of things to kids and keep them interested. Uh, some cons about it, limited on what you can feed them. Yes, you can't put as much stuff in a worm bin as you can in a regular compost bin. Obviously, here again, copious amounts of dry material, leaves, grass, wood chips. Obviously, you're not going to put that in a worm bin. Uh, worm bins are going to be a lot better off for food scraps and uh, coffee and things like that. Why, why would you do that if you want to do both? I know some people that just static pile their yard waste and then they worm bin all their kitchen waste because the worm castings are better than the, the yard waste compost. And it's faster. I mean, these worms will give you compost in a couple of weeks. I mean, they just will. If they're doing it right, you'll have some compost in there in, in two to three weeks that you can actually use in your potting plants or outside. They are temperature sensitive. We live in a temperate climate here. The worms are not native to West Virginia. The red wigglers do live in the southern United States, so we are too cold here for them. Uh, once again, the class that we put on burma compost, you know, I'll give you guys some tips and ideas on how to keep those worms happy when it's cold. If you want to keep them outside, you can do it with some engineering. Uh, but most worm bins need to be kept in the house or in the basement or an unheated garage. It works pretty good. Uh, red wigglers can get down to about 55, 50 degrees before they will get cold injury and die. Uh, they can go down to about 45 degrees for a few hours. So if you've got that unheated garage, as long as it stays 45 degrees and warmer, you're okay. If not, then that might not be the best place to go in winter. I really like a basement. I know not everybody has a basement, but a basement's a great place for that. A laundry room's a great place for that. And, you know, I haven't done it, but if you're ever so bigger, I guess you can put them in the living room or bedroom. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you want to tell them a good night like, story tonight. Who knows? Uh, my son would do that. He would probably try to refill the bill. Feed ratio on how many worms in the bin of capacity. There's, there's a ratio that I can give you guys to take the class and talk about how many worms you can have and how many pounds of waste. That's based off your diet and how many people are in your family about how many worms you start with. So, you know, that there is a little bit of math involved in the beginning, but once again, I'm here to help you with that, so that's not a problem. Medium learning curve, there is. I mean, this is a living system. There are worms. They're not like the static pile where you're just throwing it in and turning your back and walking away. You know, then you're going to have to check for some, some bin health. I mean, there's some issues that can crop up on you. It can be labor intensive at times. And what I say by that is, is it depends on how you want to do things. But if you're the person who's wanting to salvage every single egg and every single worm, then what most people do is they dump all their compost on a big sheet or a big tarp out in the driveway and they sit down and they start digging through it and they look for all the little worm eggs and they'll collect them and keep them. Uh, some people are like, you know what, I don't care about that. I'm just going to take a third of my compost and I'm going to screen out all the adult worms. I don't care about the eggs. I'm just going to take a third of it. I'm going to go use it. Or I'm going to take two thirds of it. I'm going to use it. I'm going to keep a third. And I'm going to put it back in the bin and start adding new stuff. And that way you've added your adults back, but you've added at least a third of the eggs that they've laid. And then the other eggs just dry out with the compost or die in your flower bed. Um, you know, as winter comes. Put them out there in the spring, you're going to have red wigglers hatch out and live in your garden soil, which is not a bad thing at all. Who knows they're not going to overwinter out there. So, you guys have any questions on any of that stuff? Okay, my last slide right there is compost resources. I gave you guys that Cornell website. I want to give you a couple other ones here. There's EPA.gov, RecyclingCompostHome.gov. That is an excellent resource too. That's the EPA. Most of that has been backed up by University 
uh, research and things like that. So the EPA really didn't go out and do their own compost research. They kind of relied on the big universities around the country to do it. A lot of good information. A lot of, a lot of more in detail about what I cover today. You can find on that website and get down into the weeds of it. Uh, Gardeners.com. Uh, right there is composters, books, and resources. That's a, that's a place where you can buy all that stuff. Um, I'm a Gardener's uh, fan. I don't know if any of you guys get Gardener's magazines already or anything, but uh, I got a lot of nice, neat, cool stuff. But if you're looking for the composters, you're looking for the books, that's a good place to go. Lowe's and Home Depot tend to only buy like one unit a year. There's literally probably 60 units on the market at this point, definitely over the 40 when I was doing it, so probably 60 now. Um, so. Gardeners or Amazon's want to have a lot better selection than what the local feed store is. So just make sure you guys do your homework on all those. Read, read, read all the reviews on that stuff. It's all, all of them are created equally. Uh, Uncle Jim's Worm Farm. If you are interested in worm compost, that's something that I've struck your uh, fancy with today talking about. Uncle Jim's is one of the best ones out there. He sells the worms. He sells the resources. There's also online resources on his website that are free for you to read uh, that gets you started in uh, the world of uh, permacomposting and then the compostingcouncil.org man there's an organization for anything you can imagine these days but this literally is the international compost council organization that is global in several different countries and they're supposed to be the informative uh, on compost once again their website's full of a lot of good stuff most of it's going to be linked to other websites though like that EPA site that I gave you. So if you guys want to leave today and you want to read more, I definitely would start with the Cornell website that I gave you in that, that second slide and that EPA one here on the top of this first one to get more resources on that, okay? And uh, our information's there at the bottom. Brad, Melissa, sorry, Connie, I need to update you. You're fine. You on there, <laughs> we can get you in touch with Connie, too. You guys have any questions on the composting or anything in general? Yes. Do. At the Man Mill Garden, we get successful compost, but we have one of those three foot long thermometers and the highest temperature I've seen in there is only 90 degrees. Yeah. So what what can we do to make it? You need product? more, you need more, you need more nitrogen. More nitrogen. Yeah, and I tell you, I tell you what you can do is, uh, and, and 90 degrees will break down still, don't get me wrong guys, it will break down and break down slow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when I was at West Virginia State University, we had an anaerobic digester, so we have a lot of chicken waste. I know you talked to Mike many times now, I'm sure he's filled you in on that stuff. We would dump that liquid chicken poop into our compost piles. I've actually seen one hit 182. 182 is as hot as I've seen it. It was uncomfortable to hold it in your hand or stick your hand in. I mean, he was in and he was out. Like, it was one of burn you. Uh, so much so that when we flipped it over, it was completely white and gray inside, like ash. I mean, it was literally, and you're getting close to combustion when you get to that. You gotta be careful when you get that hot. Yes. You can use those um, bacteria in a bag yes, too because was, they have they have chicken manure in them. So there's there's that too, like Connie was saying, they're in a bag, they come in a sprinkler, like a big can that you can shake in there. You can buy that, you can see that on Amazon. Greens actually carries that it's compost booster, pile boosters, a lot of times it'll be marketed as that way. Compost micro, they will heat it back up. But it's a little pricey to buy that all the time. So I tell you what I would like to do if you do not have poultry litter. Just go down to Greens and spend $12 to get a 50 pound bag of urea. That's all you need to get. And put it in a five gallon bucket, put a lid on it so it doesn't get wet and evaporate into the atmosphere. Grab a couple handfuls of that. If you've got a three by three pile or a four by four, one good hand pop, one handful of that urea and just chuck that in and mix that up real good. Go back two days later, put that thermometer in there. I promise you it probably jumped 20 degrees at that point, okay? But once again, that's an added expense. You have to buy it. You've got to manage. So some people feel some kind of way about that. So um, I don't. I've used it. It works great. If you've got a bigger pile, once you get an 86 to a six foot by six foot, eight by eight, you probably going to want to use two. And any more than that, probably three, maybe four handfuls into that pile of mix, which will heat up. But if you've got chickens, or you've got access to poultry litter, that by far is probably the best thing you can put in there to heat it back up. But we had that same problem with animals out here on Rutland. Too. We had the same problem. Jean kept it at the base of the mountain. She kept the tarp on to try to keep the rain, but the tarp was trapped in condensation, and as the rain came down the mountain, it wet at the base of the mountain. So it was just sobbing everything up. And she got good compost, it just took a long time. And you know, it's probably the same things happening there. You guys have got more wet material than what you've got dry material. 
a lot of times it's going in that depending on the load. I know they're bringing stuff back from the kitchen too, right? The composting. Yeah. So it's a lot of wet material. So uh, maybe uh, maybe you need to figure out say AG. Uh, you know, we go buy you know two or three bells of straw and keep over there in the tractor shed or something. Or as those leaves start to fall here, maybe she gets a couple of volunteers, the younger ones get out there one day and break them up in trash bags and compress them in the bag as much as they can and put them in the shed so they don't get wet. And then you guys can add that throughout the winter as that comes. Uh, but worst case scenario, you can add a little bit of urea in there. But if it's really soppy and wet with a lot of juice running around, even the urea is not going to really heat it up because it's going to kind of counteract. So if it's a loose, dry material that it's just not breaking down, throw some urea in there and see what it will do. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> How about doing it during the winter? So, same thing. If you can do it during the winter, yes. Absolutely. And that's the whole thing. As long as your microbes are inside there, they're happy. And as long as it's warm, they'll be doing their thing. So, uh, yeah, you don't need to go out here and work out a blanket or anything. If you've got a small pile, wintertime can kind of be hard. And sometimes the cold will actually penetrate the center of the pile. The bigger your pile for the winter, the better you are. You guys are in bins. You're in town. You've got the wood bin, you've got the roof over top of it. So I think for you, I think in that setup. Okay. Well, you could. There's still food waste coming out of the kitchen. So that, and, and if you back up some dry material or you straw or get somebody, I mean, Jean knows lots of people. She's got connections. Tell her to get a farmer and bring, maybe bring in a round bell of hay and cover. I don't know. So something you can keep dry to use as your, your dry source. You could roll all winter long. Well, guys, thanks for coming and listening to me talk about composting. Hopefully you learned something today.